Welcome back to Turpentine VC, a podcast where we discuss the art and science of building successful venture firms, VC to VC. Today's episode is with Logan Bartlett of Redpoint, who joined the firm in 2020. In the conversation ahead, we dive into the unique ways that Redpoint operates and talk about the past, present, and future of the most powerful venture firms. We filmed this episode with Logan at Redpoint's offices in San Francisco, a backdrop that may look familiar because it's where he records his excellent podcast, The Logan Bartlett Show. Without further ado, here's my interview with Logan. Logan, welcome to the podcast. Eric, thanks for having me on. Welcome to our, uh, yeah, our little studio here. Yeah, thanks for hosting me. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is where the magic happens? This is, yeah, magic. Yeah, it's <laughs> generous. But yes, this is where yeah. we record our, our, our podcast. So uh, I feel like this podcast is for venture nerds. And I feel like you're the ultimate venture nerd. I, I am very much. We were talking about interest last night at dinner with uh, one of my partners. And I was like, you know, I listen to a lot of uh, audiobooks about venture, <laughs> audiobooks about technology, yeah. markets. Yeah, you, you were saying that um, the the Power Law book that came out that sort of chronicled the history of venture, you were were annoyed by that because you feel like you had some arbitrage by doing the research yourself. Yeah, the first party stuff of like going back and actually looking at the old Don Valentine, like Cal interviews and all that stuff. Now, it, I feel like between Acquired and the Power Law book, they've they've done a great job democratizing access to all these things that I pieced together, together over the years. So. And how do you, like, how does that make you a better investor? Or like, what edge do you think there is in, in understanding the history of, of venture? Why, why, why care? I think market cycles are a very interesting thing and understanding how history of things came to be is just like, uh, not that past is only indicative of future, uh, but without knowing the past, whatever that phrase is, doomed to repeat it or something, right? I, I feel that I, I, I've been reading a book recently about like how markets have evolved. And it's interesting if you go back and look at the railroad uh some of the terminology that they use in the UK and the US about the railroad versus canals and all that, like you could actually just control F railroad and do AI or crypto or internet or whatever it is, right? And so we think all of these things are normal and novel. And it turns out they're not. We've been talking about it since the railroad did it to canals or telephones did it uh, to telegraphs or electricity did it to, you know, whatever, candles and that stuff and PCs and cars and oil and internet and all of that stuff. Like there's some kernels of of commonality that exists between them. And so understanding them, I think, helps in some ways to predict the future. Yeah, we um, we had Eric and Sarah from Benchmark on and they were talking about how certain firms came up in certain eras, like Benchmark is distinctly an internet era firm, you know, Sequoia, you know, the previous wave, you know, Andreessen and Mobile, like, um, and how firms came up which eras can determine sort of perhaps how they're structured and might have some path dependency go going forward. Yeah, I think the founding, like, it's true of companies, and I think it's true of, true of venture firms that like, the the decisions you make at founding in the early days, those, those kernels of truth, you're define the future of like, you can never undo equity split once you started a company. Like that's going to define elements of your business forever. And I think that the structure of venture firms are very much rooted in their founding, which is just, it's an interesting thing, right? Benchmark uh, grew very quickly uh, over the course of, maybe not very quickly, but grew grew over the course of the 2000s. And now people forget, but they had Israel and they had Europe and all these different uh, funds. And then they shrunk back down to their knitting and found this truism that they've hold, held consistent throughout. And so it's kind of like parenting. I feel like you're, you either do the exact same things your parents did or the exact opposite things your parents did. The founding of all of these stories, be it technology companies or venture firms, hold some truth to how they operate today. Yeah, and Kleiner, similar to Benchmark, you know, expanded, did a bunch of stuff, then then consolidated recently. Uh, over the last decade, we've had, you know, new firms and other firms expand significantly. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see over the next decade whether they too consolidate, you know, fly too close to the sun and then, can, you know, sort of narrow and consolidate or whether they're just kind of into the sunset, just they're path dependent on this sort of AUM aggregation. And, uh, you know, we'll see where that goes. From yeah, now. it's it's interesting. I think people maybe over extrapolated the lessons learned in private equity or other asset classes to venture that it was this inevitable barbelling that was going to happen. And maybe that happens in the fullness of time. But there is a certain amount of capital that an ecosystem at any one time can take in. And there are very uh, nuanced relationships to the people, particularly at the earlier stage that you're developing with founders and stuff. And so I think where there's these very linear asset classes like 
private equity or uh, real estate or whatever it is, where the distribution of returns to be the 25th uh, percentile firm versus the, or sorry, 75th versus the 76th, the returns are pretty normally distributed all the way down versus venture is very stair-stepped in that regard. And I think people assumed that we could hold consistent the lessons of private equity to venture. And I think it's I think it's just a weird asset class for all the reasons that I love it and that you love it and that LPs either love it or hate it. <laughs> and 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 the lesson there that people are trying to extrapolate would that be there would be a normal distribution or both that uh, that the barbelling and the hollowing out of the middle was going to happen in a very meaningful way. I think if 2021 continued to play out over the course of the next five years, we probably would have seen that occur because of. Uh, because of LP dollars consolidating to the to the top managers, and that was one of the things that when we last fundraised, uh, it was it was thankfully a very easy process. But there were so many questions about like how do you exist in the world of Tiger? And I'll use Tiger as a uh, as an analogy for any other firm that I don't want to. Uh, they, they feel it feels like whatever, for whatever reason they're like it's okay to say them, but everyone else I don't want to duck on. But picture any firm with AUM above uh, four billion dollars in their most recent commingled funds, right? Uh, so we can use that as a uh, as a as a yeah placeholder for them. But uh, it was so much about how can you survive in that in that world, and it's funny now that it's totally swung back the other way of like oh thankfully you're not trying to be those things right and i think that the the just asset class kind of has these nuances where the hollowing out of the middle isn't as definitive as it is in some of these other asset classes or service providers or whatever it is it's not quite the same and maybe it will be in the fullness of time but um it hasn't proven that it is what led to the rise of these mega funds basically new LP capital that wasn't as like multiple sensitive or I guess what's I the most I think so I mean I, I think zero interest rate phenomenon is probably like the the single biggest thing that that led to that uh and uh tw the the 12 year bull run or whatever it was that kind of followed through that um and it, therefore it led to a seeking of risk uh because you couldn't get in in safer places and it led to everything looking up into the right and goodness and then there's very much the circular element of the venture ecosystem of just like lp dollars flushing from one hand to the other right you have tech companies selling to tech companies that uh when that spigot goes off everything uh looks bad when it was going everything looks good and so i think that was part of it oil's obviously been a very uh uh, good asset class um, for for some of the sovereign wealth funds as well, and so I think as they s looked for diversification, tech seemed like a new place that they could park money and seek return. And uh, now there's golf and whatever else that's going to play out that you can you can do that in as well. But uh, but I think we saw kind of all those things commingled together and. To some extent, I think that uh, that venture managers, it's a very natural instinct. If you're if you're a pure capitalist in its purest sense of like, hey, let me pursue how much money I can make. Yeah. Now we're talking. And no one's zero or a hundred percent on the spectrum. But do you believe that in the zero interest rate phenomenon of bigger funds and all that, you're you're definitely drinking your own Kool-Aid and believing, oh yeah, of course I can manage five, six, eight billion dollars, right? And you know what? If I only believe that 20%, or if I only believe that 80%, I still do pretty well financially if our funds get to that size. And people tell themselves different narratives and like, no, 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 we spend it all on our service providers or no, we uh, we need to be that big for the, the longevity to support the companies over time. There's all these different narratives that there's elements of truth in for sure. I don't want to be absolute about that. There's not. But uh, people tell themselves these narratives. And in truth, like management fees can be a sticky drug to get hooked on and paying yourselves bigger and bigger salaries, it's not a zero or a hundred percent. But I think some people saw, hey, maybe I'm wrong, but if I'm wrong, I will, you know, there's like those memes of crying tears with money on your face of Dave Chappelle. Like if I'm wrong, I'll be crying like that. Right. And so I don't know. I don't want to be overly cynical about it. Maybe people were just purely opti optimistic about the technology and all that stuff. I don't know. I, I The answer isn't zero or one in there. It's probably somewhere in between. Yeah. It's, it's on some level, it's an EV sort of trade off of like you can, you know, raise consistent four hundred million dollar funds like Benchmark or whatever they're doing and hope to twenty exit, or you can uh, 
you know, try to get 40 billion AUM and try to two exit, you know, it's not like apples to apples, but, um, and one has with the fees, there's less downside. Um, and so at some point it's just an expected value. I, I, I sat down with a hedge fund manager, a very prominent one that people would know their name one time. And, uh, he sat there and, um, we, we were in his office and, um, he goes, Logan, you know, the thing about your business is, and I'm like, no, what's the thing about my business? He goes, it's actually a shitty business. <laughs> and, and I couldn't help but laugh. I was like, oh, interesting. And I think he was, this is, this is five plus years ago. And I think he was like kind of recruiting me, uh, at the, at the time to like come and do privates with him. But he's like, here's why it's a shitty business. He, he goes, I can make more in a day than you can make in 10 years. <laughs> and I'm like, that's actually a hundred percent true. Like comparatively, you, Mr. Big Hedge Fund Manager, your business is so much better than. I, and he goes, Benchmark have so much respect for them, the best firm. They take five hundred, they turn it into five billion. I can do that over the course of a big, big systemic shock. And he actually made a ton of money during COVID and he was a hundred percent right, right? But it is funny in like a pure capitalistic sense. There's much better asset classes than venture if what you're seeking are dollars to yourself or assets under management or uh, just dollar-based. There's much better asset classes that exist out there. And, uh, and so you have to be in venture, I think, or one of the reasons to do venture, if given the choice to do other things, which I was fortunate enough in 2013, I was sort of picking one path or the other. And I just like that artisanal craft of working with founders and all, all that stuff that uh, maybe it's a maybe it's a delusion. It makes me not a great uh, capitalist. That like I I sort of like that little craft of this rather than just tasting the bigger pie of things. Yes, yeah. well, relative to hedge fund, sure. But if you love startups l l like you do, like I do, and for many people in our position, there's the hey, do I start a company or do do I be an investor? It feels like for many people, um, and it's not a jo enough jobs for everybody. But the expected value of being an investor is just higher. Where even if you aren't super successful, one, you won't find out for a long time. Two, maybe other people will never find out and think you are successful. And three, you'll you'll make a lot of money or, or a, a good amount of money either way. Maybe your upside is capped. Maybe, you know, unless you, you're you not having this like burning ambition that you're one thing you're focusing on changing the world in that way, but the expected value in other ways. Failed venture, senior venture capitalists are called millionaires. <laughs> like failed <laughs> yeah. founders are yeah. called like broke, like yeah, needing exactly. to go find other jobs, right? Uh, and so, not just yes. millionaires, tens of millions, hundreds yeah, of millions. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Failed hedge fund manager. Yeah, it is different. I, I wonder, I wasn't, it's interesting because my dad was somewhat of an entrepreneur or like had an entrepreneurial role. And um, I it just never really crossed my mind as a kid to go down that path. And he worked in the financial service industry. He he did uh, uh, he did financial printing for uh, for big Wall Street firms when companies were going public. Once upon a time, there were PDFs around it, and uh, or not PDFs. They were actually documents. And they needed to be bound and sent out and all that stuff. And I remember as a ten year old thinking to him, I said to him, I was like, "Won't this go away with the computer and everything's going to be on the computer?" He's like, "No, no, no. People like paper, right?" And of course, like. That was exactly what happened. And so I wonder, I haven't like psychoanalyzed the entrepreneurial journey. He was very much an entrepreneur and uh, had that vision and dream to do something. And I wonder if having seen an asset class or, or an industry collapse underneath him led me again against going down that path. And so maybe I picked a slightly safer one. So I'm 35 years old. I've thought now more about like, what if I was actually an entrepreneur and not, not like I'm going to go actually do it. Uh, but it, it's it, that question. I never raised that question from 22 to 35. And now, because maybe I've reached the point that I was working towards, I was on that journey all the way. And now I'm here and you look around and you're like, oh gosh, I, I, I got to where I was going. And, uh, what were the other alternative paths that existed out there? Totally. Well, and the hard thing is your opportunity cost is just so high now. <laughs> totally. I, I kind of get, I mean, I'm sure you find this, but I kind of get, it's weird because I don't want to over, um, uh, draw an analogy of being a founder with like having a podcast and trying something. Cause it's not actually that, like I have a very safe safety net of a full-time job. People have asked me, Hey, why do you keep doing it? Why do you get motivation out of it? And there's a bunch of different reasons that I can articulate of why, but honestly, I think the, the, Maybe the biggest part of it is like it gives me some itch of something that every day I 
can think about with 10% of my brain and iterate on and try to get a little better at. And there's some mastery in that, that I control my own destiny versus my whole career to date has been sort of advisory and like, hey, here's the best opinion I have, but you need to make a decision. Yeah. In a conversation with Daniel Gross a long time ago, he once told me um, just doing venture alone is uh it's not high twitch enough for you. You need to be making decisions. You need to be, have a uh, autonomy. You need to have like a playground. And uh, yeah, podcast has been for me and, and for you too. Yeah, I I, I wish Daniel Gross uh, <laughs> had, had told me yeah. that that I would have realized. Yeah. Uh, I, I would have realized that. Yeah, and, and there's a reason that a lot of people get into it at some point uh, after some level of operational yeah. success. And I think I thought as a like coming up in the industry and aspiring to get there. I think I thought because there were only two paths to pursue and one is up and one is over and over only exists if you succeed as an operator to some extent. But I do think there's elements, one, being able to draw on the experiences uh, and go deep around specific examples of, hey, here's how we did X, Y, and Z thing at, 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 at my company. I think that certainly is helpful. And then, uh, and then also... There's, there's just an element of, uh, when you've climbed a hill as an operator, um, being able to, uh, see across a bunch of different things and not be singularly committed and deal with the manicness of being an operator. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing. And of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash turpentine. That's oracle.com slash turpentine. oracle.com slash turpentine. I get the sense that you're trying to be one of the greats at, at, at this craft. Who are your biggest role models? The person that I, I like sort of singularly ha have always looked up to, and I've been fortunate enough to have him on my podcast, is Peter Fenton. Um, and I don't know him well. We sat together for 90 minutes or whatever. And uh, I, I think the way he practiced the craft and how he thinks about risk and return and the relationships and the gravitas that he carries, not to mention just like the returns he's had and whatever, all that stuff. He also made a switch from Excel to uh, to benchmark at a similar-ish age in his career. He also, uh, weirdly and early on, when it wasn't normal, and it was more normal when I did it than when he did it, want, decided that he wanted to get into the industry and do that. He was like a career investor, right, along the way. And his dad was a venture capitalist. And so like he sort of picked that path uh, based on that. And I weirdly sort of decided early on, like this was my ultimate uh, desire and fulfillment that I was going to derive from it. So I would say he's the single uh, person that, I, that I've that uh, i spent, I've watched every YouTube video he's ever done, every podcast he's ever been on, everything he's written about, right? Uh, so he's the one that stands out when you ask that question. But I could go through a list of just like, there's people like Peter Thiel and Keith Raboy, who I think practice the craft so differently and think so differently than I do. And I, I've tried to figure out their, their like risk seeking and their uh, contrarianism and their, uh, I don't know, like ethos is just so different than uh, how I, I feel like I operate. And I've gotten, I've been fortunate enough to work with Keith on something I've never interacted with Peter, but uh, it's just so different than me. And that's fascinating. And that's what I think is so interesting about this asset class is there's not one way to practice it, right? There's a bunch of different people throwing a bunch of different things out there. And it's hard when you hire. Like, what are you looking for when there's Mike Moritz, who is like a journalist, or Peter Fenton, who like grew up in that world, or Doug Leone, who was a salesperson, or Keith, who was an operator or whatever? Like, what do you... What do you hire for? And I don't know the answer to it, but yeah, there's a bunch of people we could probably talk about forever. I've deeply admired both Keith and Peter's sort of ability to create talent clusters. Uh, you know, you know, Stanford, PayPal, uh, Open Door, uh, even like Keith's soccer league. Like just whatever they they do, they're always thinking about um, 
sort of like investing long term in, in in talent and in the talent that they know and creating these these clusters ar around them both professionally and socially in, in this really interesting way. There's a weird level of I sort of think when you're a founder and an operator you think you happen to the world. And when you're an investor in some ways, you think the world happens to you. And, and I have an investor mindset of like, I randomly serendipitously, serendipitously bump into things and then things happen in the world. And, uh, and I think Peter and Keith both believe that they, they happen to the world and that the clusters they make them manifest. And it's proven to be true. There's probably some level of, um, confidence that I don't have in that. But uh, there's also some willing things into existence in that. And so like, if you if you say Miami is going to be a thing long enough and loud enough and and meaningfully enough, it eventually uh, could become a thing. And like, I would never even in a million years think about taking all the arrows that go along with shouting as loudly on Twitter about that. And so I think that it's a very interesting thing. And to some extent, I think there's an element of like that talent clusterness. I wonder how much is the self-selection and specialness of the people around them that opt into that, that also view the world the same way versus the hands that they're able to shape the clay in some way of the people around them. And I think it's probably elements of both. Like it, it seems like all the PayPal people probably would have been mostly somewhat independently successful on their own because they're so different and have done so many different things. But then you look at the people that have come up within their firm and I have to think there was a lot of mentorship and guidance along the way there. So totally. I mean, it's amazing. You know, I think Keith bet on Delian. Delian was like 20 years old or something, like putting him into Teespring. Like there's so many people at their earliest parts of their careers that Keith, like in his mid forties, just saw the talent and, and was willing to, to, to make a bet. And I've on. asked him, I've asked him what he looks for in people just to try to, I, this is sort of just me being a venture nerd, trying to steal little bits from other people. And he will always say it's the spikes uh, in people. And you can augment everything else, um, it, which is weird because I think naturally, like I, I, as a liberal arts school educated uh, uh, person, I've, I've sort of, <laughs> I think my natural bias is like people being good at a bunch of different things, right? That's like what liberal arts school tends to teach you is like, oh no, you need a broad range of experiences. And it's sort of the Roger Federer mindset of he played a bunch of sports growing up and then master of tennis after over time. And I think uh, Keith very much solves for like, where do they deeply spike? And then we can augment everything else around them, which is just a different way of, of, of thinking about talent. Yeah. I think the other thing Teal has is he embodies this quote of, if you can't compete on history, you can compete on philosophy. Um, and not to say he can't compete in history, but I feel like Founders Fund is the, is the firm where you can most kind of tell like, hey, this company is a Founders Fund company, you know, Andrew or, or Palantir um, or even SpaceX at the time. I, I think that they're just, willing to be so it's, it's your it's your line right be donald trump don't be jeb bush yeah they, they're they they're willing to be polarizing in a in a way that um it, you know when you have a hundred thousand people uh on twitter responding to you and you have a 90 percent approval rate or something that's ten thousand people yelling at you and ten thousand people yelling at you it's hard to quantify oh no i have a 90 percent approval rating when you have ten thousand people saying you suck like it it, it feels bad and uh <laughs> and and ultimately um there was there was an insight philosophically or a branding that they leaned into either by accident or purpose and i don't know uh and there's probably elements of both that like hey this worldview that they have and this founder type they're looking for uh they can deeply appeal to that group and uh, i think if you were just walking around san francisco in 2012 you would have thought the ethos that they were appealing to was 5% or 10% or whatever it was. The peak of Barack Obama's presidency and San Francisco's vibrancy and all that. You would think that that was such a small portion. And it turns out maybe it was a small portion of San Francisco, but it was actually a much bigger portion of entrepreneurs and successful entrepreneurs. And so appealing to that group very deeply allowed them to, there's some person out there that's a young founder who's uh, contrarian and anti-establishment and Founders Fund is Sequoia to them. And it's like, that is actually amazing. And, and it's such a, they've been able to do it over, a, in the relative sense, a very short period of time that they've been able to deeply appeal. And the bet that they made was that's actually a bigger portion of the population than you would think. And it turns out like, 
yeah, maybe it was 5% of San Francisco in 2012, but it's, uh, I don't know, 15% now. And it's actually 40% of founders in general or some number that like is way bigger than I think anyone would have appreciated. And so it's like the contrarian and right two by two. Uh, they were definitely contrarian and right in that view. And it's proven totally. out. Yeah. I mean, Teal was vitri you know, vilified when he supported Trump in 2016, ran, ran out of town basically. And yeah, I remember Delian also did this experiment for a month where he wore a uh, MAGA hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it still gets brought up every now and again. It makes me laugh. I, uh, yeah. And people still like, uh, they'll they'll still comment in his replies yeah. about that thing to him and it's a funny thing and I, I would have to lay sideways on this couch and let you uh like turn this into more of a therapy session of like why i'm just not comfortable having people be that mad at me all the time like anonymous people on the internet telling you you suck i don't like it uh yeah. and for some reason they, they revel in it and it's some confidence thing and it's some uh, well, it's, it's if you make it to the other side you become like indestructible like palmer lucky or something like you you, uh, you just transcend this this level and then you, yeah it's like and i think a lot of them have delian has palmer has I mean, it's the best uh salon obviously it's the best guests to have or people to talk to at dinner parties or whatever because you know it's just going to be interesting, right? And I I get such a kick out of talking to any of the... And I, I imagine my worldviews, if we were to lay them out, probably don't align uh, very much with the way they view the world. But like, there's so much to learn from talking to people like that. And it's fun. It's entertaining. And like... You, ugh. I don't know. You can't take what, what is it? You can't take life too seriously. You won't make it out alive. Uh, and that's sort of the way I feel about all of that. It's it's. I don't know what percentage is performative. I've asked Keith that question. I'm like, how much of your Twitter is performative or not? And he claims not a lot. Yeah. But then you meet him, and he's like very different than that. And so I think some of it is, and also he just gets a kick out of doing it, right? Yeah. And it makes him laugh uh, to himself. And then he moves on and goes about his like actual day. And versus me getting yelled at, I'm like, ah, I this messes up my day, right? He turns off his phone and yeah. goes and <laughs> to berries and calls it a day. And that's a, it's an impressive thing. Yeah. And he, one of his, one of his lines, and I don't want to just, uh, you know, just, just espouse on the founders for guys, but one of the, his lines is like, if, I forget what if half of my venture friends don't make fun of me for an investment, it's not challenging or it's, I'm not pushing it enough. And like, that is definitely not my mindset, right? I, I do not want uh, half of my venture friends making fun of me for an investment. But. Yeah, no, totally. Um, love those guys. Uh, let's segue the um, somewhere red point. So on this podcast, we've talked to Sequoia, we talked to Benchmark, USV, a number of firms sort of like when we talk about the history of venture capital, where their firm kind of fits in, how to think about their, their firm in the context of that, and then also how to think about their firm in the context of today, of some of the big players, sort of, you know, where do they spike, stand out, et cetera. Why don't you give some of that both historical context of of, of Redpoint and how it makes sense in the in the context of of sort of the history of venture, and then also today, how should people How we think, evolved, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so uh, Redpoint had an interesting history where in 1999, uh, IVP and Brentwood, which was two of the, the hottest firms, uh, the, a lot of their people came together and started uh, Redpoint. And it was like the internet of internet darling funds. And you can go back and read all the PR clippings and all that stuff. And uh, it was on all the television networks and the first, I forget if it was the first internet fund, but it was like the biggest internet fund. And I think it was like maybe $750 million raised in the first, uh, uh, in 99. And then like a year later came back and raised, I think a billion plus or something. Right. And it was like peak bubble, uh, hottest uh, thing out there. And this sort of goes back to the founding story and having its roots in all these firms or companies is, well, we, we sort of know what happened after the internet bubble was it was a very long, uh, uh, dark period of time for internet focused big funds. And what did that mean? Well, it meant that whereas I think in the early days of Redpoint, people were courting the press and everyone was kissing their ass saying, oh my gosh, this is so amazing and you're an internet fund and like you're so big and you're ambitious and all that. Uh, I think they learned a uh, the group shied away from press, right? And, uh, and mostly kept themselves out of the limelight for 15 years after that and just kind of went to work uh, and and stayed away from a bunch of those things. And there was there was figuring out exactly what the evolution of the firm was going to be like over that period of time. There was nurturing the next generation of people to come up. There was 
trying to pick the the big next opportunities that were that were going to come out of the the vintage post internet and what what emerged was a very uh, resilient uh group who had eschewed a lot of the uh the the things that came into vogue that came back into vogue over the course of the last couple of years right and so Again, when you go through the founding of these things, you're, we, I think, institutionally had a lot of scar tissue from seeking too much publicity, raising too much money, drawing attention to yourself as the main character, which is ironic now that I, I do podcasts and stuff like that, right? Uh, it, yeah, but that that ethos in us sort of came to be. And then we were fortunate enough through 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, we invested in uh, a handful of businesses that proved to be pretty uh, transformative stripe. And then after that, Snowflake, and we were in um, uh, DraftKings and Series A and Looker and um, Sentinel One and HashiCorp and Zendesk and Twilio and a bunch of those, right? And so it was a really good run of just like putting our head down and doing all that. The founders also did a really nice job of recruiting in the next generation of leadership. Uh, and so my partners, Scott and Satish came in and they kind of served as the stewards that helped with the transition of the founding group stepping back and then sort of stepping up. And so where we are today is we we have an early fund, we have a growth fund. I'm on the growth fund. We call it early growth. It's mostly series B, series C's. Um, we have uh, four partners on one, three partners on the other, a team of call it uh, eight on both sides in total. And what we're looking for, we're smaller probably than the firms that look like us. Uh, we're, we operate more autonomously than other firms. We're not, um, our, our growth fund, our early growth fund isn't, isn't uh, tacked on to it. We're not raised together. We don't have a single management company that sits across both. Uh, we are distinct in our investment decisioning, in our, in our hiring, uh, in our uh, processes we run and all that stuff. Um, but we share all the services and all those things that that uh, are are very much commingled. We're a little smaller than all of the uh, the the names that people know and that you've you've had on before. That's intentional. Uh, we will stay a little smaller. Uh, our early our our growth fund is early growth. We want to go a little earlier than what you would think of as a growth fund, and we want it to stand on its own uh, and not be a follow on vehicle. Um, and all that stuff is sort of rooted in history, and it's it's worked out pretty well. You know, Sam Lesson came on the podcast and he talked about how he thinks at Seed it's going back to it's not this like clubby kind of network driven stuff. It's really finding things that other people don't want to do, so you can get in at better prices, etc. Like for the stuff that you do. Are you always competing with, with with the best? And and if so, how do you think about being Trump and not Jeb Bush in, in the analogy of be different, not just strictly worse? Yeah, I, I, so I think there's this thing. Um, so, so the clubby thing I haven't totally thought of. I think now that you say it and, or that Sam said it, I, I think that's probably true insofar as it's a byproduct of the abundance of capital in the ecosystem. And so there's just going to, I don't think it's maybe just true of seed. I think it's probably true of a bunch of different stages that people will play a little bit more zero sum. And I, I think of all the trends that have probably happened that are slightly irreversible. Um, I think the zero sum nature of elements of venture is probably going to persist in some ways. Uh, and that rounds aren't going to be split quite the same way as they were before. If you have a four or $5 billion fund, you're trying to figure out how to deploy it. You're not going to offload some of the risk to people. Uh, and so I, I think that's, that is probably true. Uh, so the question on how we view the world. So I think there's elements of uh, an email address. And I, I think about this a, a lot of like, there's an at sign that exists between an email address. And there's a before the at sign, which is Logan. And there's an after the at sign that's at Redpoint, right? And there's there's some firms that only focus on the after the at sign. And it's like, hey, the person's fungible, or we try to make the person fungible. And that's actually a great place to land because then you're not, your brand carries beyond any individual. Founders can step back, people can leave, restructurings can happen, all that. The, the after the at sign and the email address carries the day, right? Uh, we don't operate like that. The people matter to to us, and we're a group of individuals under a single umbrella that stylistically are going to appeal to different people uh, and are going to have different interests. And we try to stand out. As a firm, we try to be in the echelon of the group that people think about, right? And 
I don't know if that number's 10, if it's six, if it's 15, there's some number of people in the industry and it's probably, you know, you, a function of you're going to be in the room with the important companies and the areas we care about. We, we, we focus very much on being in the room with the important companies and that's going to evolve, right? And it's going to be, it, it, people thought it was crypto a couple of years ago. People are all in on AI now. Who knows exactly what that's going to look like in the future? But I don't think singularly focusing on a in industry or anything like that is a long-term durable strategy, just the way markets move and things like that. So ultimately, we, we I think we leverage the at red point to get in the room, and then we leverage the individual to uh, resonate in whatever way is applicable. And it doesn't always it doesn't always work, right? Like if we're doing our job well, we we should win. 50% at best of the things that we want to go after. Because I will tell you, there's another great group of those 10 people. It could be apples and oranges of what you're actually deciding on. We're not going to win 100%, nor should we. Like if we have too high of an accept acceptance rate on the term sheets we're giving, I don't know. We're probably not competing hard enough and getting ourselves into the right rooms. And so ultimately, I think the brand gets us in and the individuals are where we win. And each individual probably has a slightly different brand, a different style. I'm a little bit more out there. Some people are a little bit more measured uh, and, you know, uh, carry a room from a thoughtfulness of industry standpoint. Uh, and that resonates with founders. And ultimately, I think you need the totality of what you bring to a, a competitive situation to be better than whoever you're competing with. You don't necessarily need any single thing to spike, to go back to the earlier analogy. And that wasn't true in 2021. I think ultimately in 2021, people were solving for single things like, oh, I want the best customer intros, or I want the most recruiting talent, or I want the single, whatever, highest profile investor. And I think in general, people are probably looking for a basket that's better than whoever else you're competing with. Yeah. yeah I take your point on force rank. Um, was strongly I mean, one way i conceptualize it is it's the up leveling from going from like hey when someone brings up your name everyone's like yeah they're they're amazing we'd love to have them to like this is the name that comes up first or this is this is the name that i that i just have to have for w w whatever reason or that they're at this pantheon the way i think about it by the way is 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 i think we can beat any firm with our tier a or tier number one person throwing a perfect game right uh, we can, if, if it's in the domain and we have the relationships and we execute a great process, um, are, are there's, there's firms that, uh, we, we have to do that to, we have to execute really well because they have 50 years of history and they're, they are very venerable and, uh, we need to run a really good process, but we can still win. Um, and there's firms that if we throw, uh, if we're not throwing a very good game, they're just going to beat us 10 times out of 10. And our job is to is to keep up leveling uh, that ratio of like, we can be slightly off one night and still win. We can get there slightly late on a process standpoint and still hold our own. Like we need to keep doing those things. So the after the at sign of red point or the individual that's in the room carries a value or resonance with a founder that we don't need to throw a perfect game to beat some of the names we mentioned. Yeah. It, by the way, it is interesting how kind of nebulous um, it is when you talked about like who is the top fifty. Like, why isn't there like a Midas list for firms? Like, yeah. at the top, at highest level, people have an idea, but just to like pick on or a random like Lightspeed, which I really like, but I don't know if they're like number seven or like number thirty-five. Like uh, in terms of sort of after the first three, first five, it just kind of gets nebulous. I it? think I think it also gets really hard to even define uh, even that top three, top five thing. I, I don't. Uh, I don't know if everyone would agree on who those people are. And there's also this weird thing in venture of like the, the job that you, you do for your LPs is different than the job that you do to your, do for your founders. And so what resonates with a founder, there's, there's this weird tension that exists of like, Hey, I founders want good prices. LPs want low prices, right? And like those two things are very much at odds. And so what an LP would say of who are the best funds is going to be very different than what a founder would say of who are the best funds. And there was a period of time over 2021 that like 
the best funds, quote unquote, were just like the worst investors, right? And and so I think I think that's one reason that there's no like consistency in, in, in that is you're you're solving for different constituencies and that the way that they operate. And then I think there is individual elements and their sectors that evolve and there's people that are earlier in their career or later in their career. And ultimately a board is almost like a, a a basketball team and that you need a, you need different positions. You need someone to be a point guard and someone to be a center and someone to be a power forward. And so you're also not solving for exactly the same thing. Uh, I think maybe you're solving for the most likelihood of success, but or, or the best likelihood of success, but like sometimes you need a point guard on your team and it doesn't matter if the best power forwards available, like you want to recruit in the point guard. And so there's no like normal heuristic of even how to solve for the, the distribution. Is there an example of a firm in the last like 15 years who you feel wasn't at the top three or top five, but has kind of um, shot, maybe they were even 50 and now they're 10, but just like has had a distinct like, tier rise that you admire? You know, I, I think um, the first thing that came to mind, and it, it it was more of a rise from founding. I'll give I'll give you two that, that I admire. Um, one is Amplify, if people know them in the infrastructure uh, software investing, where like they quite literally were founded in 2012. But pick the right, a right theme, uh, which was infrastructure software and the right group of individuals to go after that. And uh, Sunil actually was an ex battery guy. And so we have that shared uh, common DNA. Um, and they've just executed it really well. And it was the right sector to go after at the right time with the right group of people. And they have risen to one of, if not the top, like seed infrastructure investors, Lenny's an old red point, uh, guy, and he's over there and doing an amazing job. And so I, I hold them in really high esteem of like having come from nothing, picked right, done it well, risen to a really high caliber there. Uh, I, I, I also, uh, again, another firm that's probably has gotten to go in the last 10 years, but I have a lot of respect for thrive and how they go about doing things. Uh, they've gotten bigger, uh, certainly than we are, but like there's an artisanal craft to how I think they think about like, what is a thrive company that I really respect. And, uh, I think founders fund, you mentioned it earlier of like, oh yeah, that's a founders fund company. I, I think that thrive tries to have an element of that as well. And I just, I like that. I like that like design taste and the types of founders that they choose to work with and the caliber of the ambitions that the, the people are going after. I think it's cool. So both of them have sort of started from nothing and, uh, and risen from there. Did thrive do Instagram? I did Instagram. Because they just also did retro. Yes, <laughs> yeah, out of and Instagram. And yeah, when yeah. I saw that, I was like, oh, that's an interesting, that, that Totally, makes sense. totally, yeah. And that's the that's the nice network effect of like the reason that venture can be count, compounding in the advantages and why it's a stair-step distribution and not a linear one is like, yeah, that access to retro uh, coming out of the Instagram team is, uh, it's a good thing to have. I think Instagram was actually kind of the first deal that put Josh originally on the map for uh, for it. And he's done a great job of, building a group of individuals around him. And there you also meet the people that work at both, I would say founder fund, amplify and thrive. And, uh, and all of them, uh, they, they have a, probably a style to them that I think is consistent and in intellect to them. That's consistent, uh, to their own firm and their own individual. And I think ultimately that's what a brand kind of is, is like we're in sort of the service provider business in some ways. And so building a brand is a group of individuals. And, and so we talked about how earlier you don't think that there's a hollowing out in terms of like, you know, this AUM aggregator machine, and then this kind of like small solo capitalist or whatever specialist thing that there will be these, uh, I don't know if these are right names, but CRVs and Mayfields and all these uh, dozens and dozens of other firms at 500, 700, uh, you know, Mavron, whatever, 300, just kind of in perpetuity and they're, they're not going anywhere. Do you think also that there, um, there won't be this kind of like consistent um, bifurcation in returns where the same firms crush it forever um, and sort of the rest don't? Like how much social mobility is there in, in sort of which firms are, are at the, you know, sort of the the upper end of power. That's a great question. I, I, by the way, I, I would say, I don't know in the hollowing out in perpetuity. I, I, I just think the, the death of the middle tier was greatly uh, exaggerated over the course of the last couple of years. I, I would think so in that, like when you're small and you go all in on something, it's much more likely to lead to random, uh, success and distribution of returns. 
um, the the like what USV has been able to do of like consistently pick new domains to go very deep into and pick companies out of that, not not blanket it, not index it, but like surgically pick opportunities within new, I forget what the thesis is or whatever they call them, uh, I think is really impressive. Um, even still, if you pick that 100% right, if you have three of them, you're going to be weighed down by the other two, right? And so I think they're true outliers of returns in general have to come from people that are all in like over the course of, uh, you know, the people that were long tech over the course of uh, 2021 and the hedge funds were the ones that totally outperformed everyone else. It's like, yeah, if you pick the right uh, asset class at the right time with risk off, then you're going to be more likely to generate the absolute generational returns. So I think in that regard, just the proliferation of people that are investing will lead to the randomness of distribution. I guess a question is, if you lop off the whatever, the people going all in on a single theme, uh, will it lead to that mobility? And it's an interesting question. All, ultimately, all logo sizes on a website look the same, right? And so being involved in these companies, uh, it does matter what stage you get involved in for the limited partners, 100%, right? The relationship matters as well uh, for the references uh, and, and what you actually did in that regard. Um, I'm not sure it's so... Uh, I think brand perception in some ways has more on the founder side has more to do with do you have those logos uh, or do you have those relationships? And on the LP side has more to do with when you got in. And so there's these two different constituents that we're sort of talking about. And I think, I think that, that there's going to be more randomness and mobility in the, uh, from the LP vantage point, but probably not from the founder vantage point. Yeah. Well, one thing I, I haven't, because I haven't been to through a ton of cycles, I haven't really appreciate until recently talking to younger founders is just how much kind of um like every five years is kind of this new generation and so i was talking to this group of really hot ai founders and um they were asking me about you know uh kind of investment styles and i brought up bill Gurley, and they were like Who, who's bill Gurley?" um uh, and i was like oh what investors do you admire and they're like and this is a commercial for them i think right yeah you know, sargo locky it was like oh interested just like how these generate like the stories don't get exactly told and well and Gurley's a perfect uh example of uh one i probably could have come up with him as well as someone that i really looked up to in the industry from coming from a finance background but still doing the craft of of bc well it does make you feel old when people yeah. don't know the people that you grew up uh idolizing it definitely makes you you feel old in that regard but then also, there's these moments in time. We 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 play an iterative game that is venture, uh, and it's it's over and over again that you're simulating it out, and you never want to locally optimize for any single decision. Yeah, it makes me appreciate folks like Elad and Keith Raboy, Elad Gill, who are able to um, kind of stay relevant every 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 new cycle. They just continue to be with the next great sort of entrepreneur. Totally, totally. I, 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 uh, I mean, uh, not to, not to just keep uh, kissing Fenton's ass, but like, I, it's also one of the things that I admire about like the ability to do Twitter and New Relic or whatever it is, right? To do uh, things at the consumer side and then things at the heavy enterprise side as well. Like, and then uh, Airtable on the sort of PLG bottoms up thing. It's like you're not singularly indexed to these one things. I, I my mentor at, at Battery was a, a guy near Jagger Wall who's an amazing investor, very like underappreciated for how good he is. But he did Glassdoor and, and Wayfair, and then like this laundry list of amazing enterprise software companies, Coupa and Braze and and Amplitude and Mercado and Data IQ, and and it was like the ability to bounce back and forth from Wayfair and Glassdoor to like this is just really impressive that people can do that stuff. And you joined Redpoint 2018, 17? Uh, no, uh, nine, December 19th. That was a time where people were raising big funds. You, you could have gone out and ra raised your own fund. Is that something that you considered? Or how did, yeah, how did you think? If not Redpoint, I probably would have raised my own fund. Uh, I, I actually, that was probably the default path. Funny enough, Redpoint turned me down for a job in 2013. I have a past email from my uh, my partner now, Elliot, saying, hey, you know, I forget exactly what he was very uh, gracious and magnanimous in his past. Uh, but 
uh, we kept in touch for six years after that. And um, I thought that I wanted to go start something. Um, and that was, I think, mostly the path that I was going to go on. Uh, and they convinced me, hey, why do that when you can come here and not have to build a brand from scratch and instead inherit a lot of success? That was definitely the fork in the road decision for me. And I don't know what actually tipped me into it. Maybe it was just a risk aversion. It was a fear of not being able to raise that fund. It was, uh, I don't know, but it, it definitely, they, they sold me very well. Uh, I'm a big hip hop fan and they all wore, there's some fancy restaurant in California or in San Francisco, I have no idea what it is. And they all wore Wu-Tang uh, Christmas sweaters uh, to this uh, to this dinner. And uh, I was like, all right, this is a place I want to come over and work at. And so it was, it was actually pretty quick. The whole thing was, I mean, you could say it was six years since they passed on me, but the whole thing was, uh, was like two and a half weeks, which wow. is, which is funny. Amazing. And um, when you think of your superpowers, um, is it like combination of domain uh, expertise and sort of a compounding um, sort of like networks or like, what, what do you think about? I think this, what makes you special? this is a weird thing to say because it's kind of um, circular in that I'm going to say it and then it's less true because I've said it. But I, I think I'm overly self-aware and overly self-critical and overly, I don't know, apologetic or trying to be diplomatic about what I know and what I don't know. And so what that means is I'm constantly living in paranoia that uh, I don't have the answer and that someone else knows better to me uh, than me. And that and so what that leads to is some level of uh, one humility with working with founders like there is there is not an answer that I feel with 100 percent certainty, like here's the way you need to do it. But I give like, here are the options and trade-offs. And I am not dogmatic in the way that a founder has seen a singular experience or an operator has seen a singular experience or two or three and been like, this is how you have to do those things. My answers are always like, listen, I really, really think you should do it this way. Uh, or I don't know, but uh, let me try to get you to someone who does. And so I, I think that that's the single thing that I, I feel most confident in. The way that manifests itself is, constant insecurity that other deals are going on that I'm not going to be out in front of other people are going to resonate with founders in ways that I'm not other industries I don't understand that I need to. And so there's definitely a level of like insecurity and motivation that comes out of, uh, knowing that, um, I don't have the credentials of other people. And, but I, I think just an awareness of what my role is, as a investor and a, a and as a board member and as an advisor to companies, I think is the single thing that I can sell the best and is the most true. I've been an advisor my entire career, right? And so never have I had the ownership of needing to make a decision. You could say that's a, a make a decision about like actually operating a company, and you could say that's a good thing. But in my mind, I think it allows for a lot of nuance and humility in talking to founders about what their options are, and also I have hundreds of things to draw on either from companies I've worked with or just like being a student of venture and technology and all that stuff. And so I will try to give the best advice that I possibly can across the holistic ver uh, version of events that have occurred in history. And, and it also seems unlike many investors, you're also a student of finance. Yeah, I think that's right. I, you know, I, I was an investment banker once upon a time. Like I, I don't know if I have particularly good, like, product artisanal uh design eye and i'm not an operator and i am not a salesperson and not, like i'm a finance apologetic finance guy self-deprecating finance guy but very much like i i really appreciate the world of hedge funds and how they operate and the public markets and all that stuff and so I, I feel I feel like venture is such a weird asset class and hedge funds are it's just so black and white. And so the score is kept every single day on how you're doing and how you're not and what's right and what's wrong. And so I very much appreciate one, not to operate in that arena because I don't know if I have the uh, intestinal or psychological fortitude to stand up to uh, the markets every day like that. Uh, but two, yes, very much like that's where I come from. That's what I started. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask if you've thought about also going earlier, um, or, you know, much earlier stage, but maybe the, the description that you just gave perhaps explains why. Yeah. And also I think, I think really early stages is really hard in that, like, let's say, let's say you're an amazing early stage investor and you, you have, uh, you hit on 200 X investments, right? Well, when there are hundred X investments, uh, one, they're really working and the ball's going really far. 
And the best founders might not need that much help in their journey alone. Maybe they do, but like, let's say that they don't. And so uh, you end up spending 95% of your time on just total shit shows that, hey, the companies aren't working. You did eight investments that aren't working. Therefore, it's consuming 95%, maybe 99% of your time. And then 1% of your time, you get to enjoy uh, that you made this great decision and the ball's going really far. And so the power law, back to the back to the book itself, but the power law of the asset class, I just think psychologically, I wouldn't be equipped to uh, to deal with um, the, the amount of failure that comes from being successful in early stage. Uh, I just think psychologically it would wear me, it would wear me down and like needing to go to board meetings over and over again where the things aren't working, uh, it, it would be tough. I think the people that do that, uh, yeah, they have a level of optimism and ambition. I think I'm probably a, uh, I don't know if it's optimistic cynic or cynical optimist, but there's definitely cynic in there somewhere. And I think that's hard to be if you're an early stage investor. Yeah. Maybe let's end with, uh, with this question. Um, let's say we're having this conversation seven years from now or 10 years from now. Do you think, what do you think is the biggest thing that's going to change in the asset class? Is is there something fundamental about how the asset class operates that you suspect to be different or, or it just the types of players look different? Or- I don't think we're like 20 to 30% overfunded in the asset class. I think we're like like three, four, five X overfunded wow. in the asset class. Like I really think there's that amount. And, and the reason I think that is because uh, maybe AI will provide a lifeboat for a lot of these very big funds and will drive bigger returns and all that. But it's weird in that the feedback loops are so long that you 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 have the success and you ride it up and the most money is made at the end of the bubble or the biggest funds are raised at the end and that's also when the 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 opportunities are the most limited until a new cycle occurs or new attack vector occurs and so i think that uh this this digital transformation this uh software eating the world this um you know, whatever next generation of consumer e-commerce, social, and all that stuff. It, I think we're going to continue to have legs to that, and I'm os- optimistic that things like uh, defense tech and healthcare and biotech and AI can provide new uh, returns and vectors for people to operate in, but. If you just look at the way asset classes run out, uh, I I think if if that that former bucket is getting longer in the tooth and the latter bucket is uncertain, it doesn't make sense for the amount of dollars that have been raised to be what I don't know what the number is, but I would guess twenty twenty one dollars were five x what twenty seventeen dollars were or something like that, and that ratio doesn't make sense. It actually might even be need to be lower than what 2017 or 2018 dollars were. And fund structures aren't built to deal with that. And so I think that we're going to see that has to play out. And it's going to play out over a long period of time. And people are not very quick to raise smaller funds as we've, we've seen. But it feels like inevitability that the asset class is going to be a fraction of what it looks like today. And I actually think that's a good thing. I think it leads to, you think about the, the biggest companies, uh, generally they're fairly capital efficient through a lot of the journey and that's true of i mean even facebook raised a ton of money but like they were actually fairly capital efficient throughout their early stage google was that way right uh all the big software companies with the exception of snowflake ish uh viva salesforce uh atlassian adobe workday ServiceNow, were all like fairly capital efficient and so I do think there's new vectors like we talked about Andrel or SpaceX or whatever. There's companies like that that are going to be much more capital intensive than it has been in the past. But uh, I'm not sure the amount of capital is commiserate with what we currently have. There were AI companies are raising a ton, you know. I and I am the most. Uh, it feels like none of the lessons of 2021 were learned in, uh, or were, were truly learned from people. And I don't know how much of that is. Hey, the tech is so exciting and so real and i think there's going to be so much gdp value created from ai the valuation assumptions and you go back to the way the markets evolve it's like it's the the returns are generated before people realize the opportunity and then the initial people pile in and they they get along for the ride and it turns out that some of them do well 
and some of them do horribly. But then the later and later in the cycle, you get the worse and worse the returns get along the way. And the the big lesson is that it's a lot easier to predict. And this is true back to, you know, uh, railroads and uh, and uh, yeah and telephones and electricity and oil and PCs, it's a lot easier to predict who the losers are than who the winners are. And so I think with all this AI thing, there's going to be some randomness uh, that occurs in all of the returns and all that. But we'll see exactly what the venture returns look like. And it's not, it's never a full blanket of like 15 companies or 50 companies that do really well. It's just not. You go back to the internet bubble and it was Amazon and it was it was Google and it was eBay and it was PayPal and it was Yahoo. And like, you know, we can say Facebook even a, a little bit after that. And we can come up with more, but the vintage of 1996 to 2002, 2003, the vintage of companies there were not 50 companies that created a ton of equity value. It was like seven, right? And if you go back and look at mobile, most of the equity value is actually captured by Apple and Google. But then you look at like the Instagrams and the Ubers and the WhatsApps, and you go through the people that created a TikTok and you go through the people that created a ton of equity value in, in mobile. And it wasn't 50. And so that's the one thing with all the valuations and all the rounds that are going on right now. Maybe you get in one of those and nothing else matters, but I'm... I'm skeptical that people have learned the lessons. Well, even with with AI, the question, you know, are, are is it going to be new new companies like with the internet era or a bunch of incumbents like with, with, with mobile? And you know, you know what mobile CRM was? It was Salesforce, yeah, exactly. right? <laughs> you know what mobile Adobe was? It was Adobe, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. And that's one of the things that I think uh, remains to be seen. I I do think that the technology itself is going to shift the underpinnings of how a lot of these businesses will work. People seem very up. People seem very up to the task to deal with the challenges. I think everyone's kind of red crossing the chasms and an innovator's dilemma and whatever yep. all these books at these companies. Some will mis-execute, some yep. will not. Uh, and so I do think there's going to be new ground for people to um, try to capture in AI, but I'm not sure it justifies uh, raising uh, 500 posts with zero revenue or whatever, or a billion, yep. but, you know, so we'll see how it all plays out. Well, let, let, let's wrap on that. You've been generous with your time. If listeners have not yet checked out the Logan Bartlett show, it's a must listen. Best investors, uh, operators in tech, as well as just some of the most interesting thinkers. It's a must listen. Uh, Logan, thanks so much for coming. Hey, out. thank you for having me. This was fun. Turpentine VC is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen and Econ 102. If you liked the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store or rate us on Spotify.